Good morning and welcome to the second Peripheral Intervention webcast for Mount Sinai Heart. I'm George Dangas, the case moderator. I want to let you know that the subject of the case today is a superficial femoral artery chronic total occlusion. Uh, during the case, you should send us your questions at uh, info at peripheralinterventions.org. Info at peripheralinterventions.org is the exact email. And also to announce that the next case is going to be on March 28 at 8 a.m. Uh, thus far, this uh, extremely successful program has been uh, viewed 3,800 times uh, uh, this year. Uh, off to the, uh, uh, to the uh, live case room with uh, Dr. Krishnan and Dr. Wiley. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's really a great pleasure to do our second case. Um, we're extremely excited today to, uh, to welcome uh, the, the clinical associate professor of uh, medicine cardiology at NYU Medical Center and director of endovascular services at the cardiac cath lab in the, in the Langone Medical Center in NYU. A dear friend, uh, a great operator, and a, and a colleague of ours, Dr. Anwar Babiev. Dr. Anwar, Thank you very welcome. much for invitation. And uh, you know, I'd like to introduce the team. You know, Dr. Dr. Jose Wiley, who's our who's our associate director of endovascular intervention at the cath lab at Mount Sinai. Ray Lascano, our nurse practitioner, will be assisting. Ricky and Elizabeth, our our nurse and our our technician for the case. I'm going to let Dr. Wiley present the case. Dr. Wiley. Good morning. This is a 76-year-old uh, uh, gentleman with a history of uh, diabetes mellitus type 2, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, atherosclerotic heart disease, that is post coronary artery bypass graft times 3, peripheral arterial disease was a prior PTA who presented with a lifestyle-limiting claudication. He wasn't able to walk more than 50 meters without having significant pain. Essentially, he had Fontaine class 2B or Rutherford class 3 claudication. Past medical history, as I stated before, surgical history at Cabbage, as I stated, uh, his family history was non-contributory. He's a prior tobacco smoker, 40 packs per year, no ETOH or IVDA. Uh, he was an adequate medical management, aspirin, uh, Lipitor, metoprolol, uh, lisinopril, and platol. Um, his um, physical examination right now, his blood pressure is 111 over 59 was a heart rate of a 68. Um, <clears throat> in terms of his uh, uh, physical examination, he's completely alert oriented, um, heart regular in rhythm, two over six systolic murmur with no gallops, uh, lungs are clear, abdomen is uh, a benign, uh, extremities are symmetric with non-papable bilateral dorsalis pedis and posterior tibialis. The laboratories were essentially normal. So um, I've, I've gone ahead and taken the liberty to go ahead and do an angiogram, which I will go over. And then Dr. Babiev will go ahead and speak about the, uh, the different approaches as we get started. I don't know if you could put the film up for, for the audience. This is a, an iliac angio, and I think it's a very good practice. I think all of us here would agree when you go ahead and approach these, uh, these uh, lesions of the lower limb to make sure you define your iliacs, make sure there are no critical stenosis. And in this case, uh, I'm going to freeze it for a second, as you can see. That, uh, there's a stent in the, in the, uh, in the uh, left common iliac artery, which we had placed earlier. So obviously, it, this clearly tells us that there's no recoil. We, we can see the stent clearly. We can see there's no critical obstructive lesions anywhere in the iliac. So in the next picture, you can see we're taking the sheath up and over. And, and uh, we, we, used a, we used a seven French here for really demonstration purposes in case we have to give dye during this case, but we can actually use a six French sheath. I know that Dr. Bobby would, would agree that probably you can tackle these with a six French. But m what's important in this is particularly to note two things. One, note the movement of the aorta as you go through. You can see it's a calcified shell. So it's very important to have a stiff wire go through. Number two, you want to be able to visualize your, your sheath, especially the tip of your marker sheath, as it goes through the stent so that you don't have any crunching or crimping of the stent or any, any capture of any of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, struts of the stent. Excuse me, struts of the stent. So right here, we used the supercore wire, and we used the pinnacle destination 7 French. Then we went up and over. Our anticoagulation of choice in our lab is, is, uh, is, is bivalrudin. Uh, obviously, a lot, of, a lot of you may use heparin, and uh, I don't think there's any right or wrong, but there is safety data associated with it. And then we go ahead and take an angiogram, and here, as you can see, I'm just going to read the anatomy and let Dr. Bobby have take over. Common femoral is moderately diffusely diseased, but no real significant obstructive lesions. You can see that the profunda femoris also has some lesions, again, uh, possibly a tight eccentric lesion in the proximal profunda. Um, the SFA is relatively a string coming down. 
and you can see as the SFA comes down, this is at the level of the adductor canal, you can see all these robust collaterals that you see on the lateral aspect of your screen. These robust collaterals are the genicular collaterals from the profunda, uh, filling the genicular collaterals of the pop and retrograde fi filling the, the uh, I can say, the um, above knee popliteal or the SFA um, in the adductor canal. And then as you go forward, it's always important, again, then discipline-wise, to, to know your anatomy but prior to your starting and also, uh, you know, make sure it's the same when you finish. So here you can see you have a diffusely diseased popliteal, but giving rise to an occluded anterior tibial artery. The tibial perineal trunk has some mild, probably diffuse disease. The, uh, the perineal artery in the center of your screen here has really just mild disease. The posterior tibial artery is robust. And as you go forward here and in, down into the foot, you can see that the majority of the filling to the foot is really through the posterior tibial artery down into the foot. The perineal does come back, and you can see that the anterior tibial is coming very, very slowly. As, as you go down and you, you go down to the foot, you go ahead and you see that the posterior tibial artery, again, is robust in, in the foot. Uh, the perineal artery does, does fill. And uh, you really do not see, you see a little bit of an anterior tibial artery coming back through collateralization. Now, having said that, we're going to just send it off to Dr. Bobby to, to uh, talk about what we're going to do. So the, um, we are dealing here with um, uh, total occlusion of the SFA, which is quite long. There is some disease in the popliteal artery as well. Uh, and there is a lesion uh, that possibly could be severe in the uh, uh, profunda. Uh, we may need a couple more views just to better evaluate that. So there are several issues here. One is how to cross uh, that SFA lesion. And uh, uh, what I see here already, uh, Dr. Krishnan did. He used the uh, uh, 035 uh, Turuma, I believe it's stiff shaft, right? Yes, it is. Turuma stiff shaft, um, hydrophilic wire uh, that he advanced into the proximal uh, SFA right now, which is uh, patent, and we can sort of track, track it down. And then there are two. Uh, kind of uh, ways of doing that. One is uh, trying to stay intraluminal and uh, uh, just with a support cath catheter of your choice. It could be uh, like in this particular situation, five French uh, vertebral catheter, which just has a very soft tip and you can navigate and turn it uh, the, uh, you know, in a different direction and try uh, different ang angulations of the wire. Or, uh, you know, sometimes people use uh, some other uh, support catheter, and it could be a 035 quick cross, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, uh, if you try to stay intraluminal, then you have to really be patient and uh, try one wire, and then if that doesn't work, uh, try to switch to other wires. There are, um, you know, specialized um, uh, CTO wires that are now available, uh, even in 018, uh, such as uh, Treasure and Astato. Uh, you can try to stay luminal and, and work through. Uh, if, um, uh, if, however, if the wire goes uh, subintimal, uh, and especially if you have a hydrophilic wire in there, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and sometimes it's just impossible to get into the true lumen, then you form a loop <coughs> on the wire, and uh, you, with the support advancing uh, that loop forward, with uh, support catheter, uh, you, don't, you have to move support catheter forward as well and try to stay to the. Come on, this side right? Support catheter. Try to stay closer to the tip. The tip of this wire is actually soft. And uh, usually, what we try to do is uh, to make a loop of this soft part of the wire, then it provides a kind of less of a trauma to the vessel and, uh, you know, uh, kind of stays more intraluminal, hopefully. And then just advance it uh, first wire and then catheter fo follows. And if you're lucky, you, uh, you may end up <coughs> still intraluminal uh, distally. Um, if not, if you find yourself uh, in a subintimal space, then you can use one of the uh, reentry catheters of choice. There are two reentry catheters that are available right now. Uh, one of them Correct. is a Pioneer catheter. And the other one is um, Outback catheter. Uh, Pioneer catheter is different from Outback uh, because it has an uh, ultrasound probe at the tip of the catheter, which uh, allows you to see where the true lumen is, and you can direct your needle into that lumen and uh, uh, you know, deploy that needle, and uh, hopefully it goes straight into intraluminal. Then you just advance the wire and uh, you, your job is done. Uh, and then you just uh, 
do whatever you believe uh, for this particular uh, patient works better. It could be uh, atherectomy, bowel angioplasty, stenting, it depends. So what uh, Dr. Um, uh, Krishnan right now did, he already advanced it. Uh, I don't remember where the reconstitution point it's was. Actually, it's actually right above the knee, uh, about the popliteal, right about here on. Okay. Here we have a calcium outline, which kind of uh, is very helpful in this situation. So you can save a lot of, inten instead of just keep injecting, you just simply just uh, use this uh, calcium uh, as a roadmap in a way and just keep advancing forward the wire with the support catheter. As long as you stay within that particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, within the vessel and the calcium will show you where you are. When loop gets too big, that yeah, means you are getting something is very wrong and you have to pull back and uh, sort of maybe redirect your wire and make sure that your Advanced. loop doesn't get too big. Advanced. I think Do uh, Dr. Babiev makes a great point here. Uh, you can see that, I'm sorry about the watch in the way. Uh, you can see that the loop is what we're trying to keep small here. And the, one of the classic teaching is the loop should not exceed the size of your distal reconstitution uh, zone. So here, push, push hard, right? So here we're, we're trying to get this catheter down below. That's enough. We're trying to get this uh, wire forward. As you can see here, a lot of resistance at the calcium zone, as you might, you might anticipate. And sometimes you just kind of kind of have to be a little brutal about it, and uh, for lack of a better word. And that's what we're doing here. Go forward here. We uh, actually have discussed this earlier. Let me, let me use my hand here, right? Um, so we've actually discussed this earlier with Dr. Babiev about, about uh, exactly what his techniques would be and what our techniques would be. Uh, don't move the wire. So the point here is to, again, advance this slowly towards this. And uh, his point is really phenomenal. Onward's point is really phenomenal in the sense that the calcium trail really does help you here. I mean, I don't know about his experience with the crosshead catheter. Here in these kind of lesions with such severe classification, we usually just uh, go ahead and, uh, and try to use a subintimal technique to get down. Number one, it, uh, as he pointed out earlier, it's very difficult to really find the true lumen and also the extensive collateralization that you see with these chronically total occluded vessels, especially like this one, makes it also easy for your, 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 um, your hydrophilic wire to get into a collateral and perforate. So, you know, a lot of times if you're able to get a nice loop, get into a nice subintimal plane, uh, as he clearly demonstrated or, or talked about, you have beautiful re-entry catheters to, uh, to be able to help you. So I'm just going to start working, um, and then and uh, with him and uh, Dr. Wiley here, and then you guys just uh, you know go ahead, George. Anything that you need to know, push forward. Yeah. Push the so another issue here. Let's talk here. a little bit about the uh, the, uh -huh. wire, the right size there. of That's the equipment. Uh, right I think you're using the wire. It's very important to say that there's a four French the end hole cathode you're using. So to get Advanced. people uh, accustomed to uh, uh, to what sizes we use, and uh, uh -huh. Anwar, you mentioned okay. something about the 018 wires. Right now, uh, we're using a 0 0.35 wire. Um, again, it's anybody's right choice to start right with a uh, straight okay. uh, uh, stiff shaft glide wire or to start with the angle. No matter how you start, ultimately you're gonna. It may form this type of loop which is actually perfect because you see this uh, live cave picture now, it is just under the diameter of the, uh, of the vessel or of the calcification, I should say, in, uh, uh, at this level, so which is pretty good. But what do you think about using 014 or 018 uh, systems, uh, Anvar or uh, PK? I, I think uh, 014 is not a good wire to use uh, in a, such a calcified vessel. I think it simply doesn't have enough uh, of uh, penetration power to go through the, so, such a long, very calcified, totally occluded uh, vessel. I think uh, it does, simply doesn't have uh, enough of a penetration power and strength. Uh, what sometimes yes. helps, especially yes. when you get close to the distal reconstitution yes. point, okay. and you, you use your loop to just to get there faster, then you can, uh, you know, uh, try to, if you, you want yes. to sort of try not to, to use a penetration, I mean, uh, reentry catheters, you can uh, yes. switch that to uh, a stator wire, which is 018, 30 gram tip wire, and try just to poke through and get into the true yeah. lumen. Well, so th these are important uh, messages in that the 018 is really the workhorse uh, uh, system. Right uh, but you could use, as, I mean, the 035 is a workhorse system, but you can exactly. use a smaller uh, wires either in the beginning if you don't see the stump very well or at the very end when you're ready to recross and perhaps this, uh, this, uh, uh, this more delicate wires could actually poke through and, uh, and, 
and enter the true lumen. So George, I don't know how this is showing to you. You can see here, like we followed clearly what Dr. Uh, Dr. Anwar said very, very clearly about uh, the loop size. We're trying to get this smaller, but because of the calcium, to have the real pushability of the, of the wire through the calcium and really cut in the subintimal plane, it's been difficult. But here you can see you have a severely dis diffusely diseased distal vessel. You have a large collateral network coming, and you can see that our loop is actually bigger than our distal wire. Now, you know, our intent here, like he spoke about earlier, is to use a reentry catheter here. But I still have to get this catheter closer in order to be able to get the reentry catheter closer down. So I'm just going to try to advance this a little bit lower. And uh, while he talks about different techniques of in case you can't get the reentry catheter down, what else you can do? Would I'm going to go ahead and go live here and just do it. Would you let me say first of all, because this is the most calcified part of the artery, are advance. people having our patients can have pain sometimes here? And advance. how do you deal with advance. that? That's right there. Uh, you, usually, uh, you know, I keep them uh, sedated enough. They, usually they don't feel much of a pain. If they start feeling uh, pain, that means you are most likely outside the vessel. So if you are staying, I mean, subintimal and not outside the vessel, they usually don't feel pain, or at least I, I, I want to make sure that they are comfortable and uh, don't feel pain yeah, and very, give them very, enough very, sedation. Very good point, very good point. Um, and uh, I think you can see that how uh, PK is using interchangeably the roadmap technique as well as uh, uh, the bare yes. fluoro in order to uh, guide his uh, uh, approach and his target Stop. towards the distal uh, uh, reference vessel that is collateralized. Uh, and he's very close. He's about uh, 15 millimeters away uh, in the submittal space above the reconstitution. It's very important to know uh, yes. that uh, the loop, when the loop approaches the, the distal uh -huh. vessel right and perhaps uh, is lucky enough to drop into it. Right. You see how, uh, you and know, how gentle he is uh, around right this right reconstitution uh, right segment and that's exactly how it needs to be done. You cannot uh, like push really hard and go get very cavalier about this. Uh, this is exactly how it needs to be done very carefully. Uh, get close, see where you are. Hopefully you are intraluminal. If not, that's not a big deal. Uh, then we will probably uh, think about using a uh, reentry catheter. So I've, uh, I've gotten down to the reconstitution zone here. I do not believe I'm intraluminal. I don't know if you can see this wire. I just want to show you how big a loop it is. It's going to be kind of hard to see. Um, do you guys see this at all? Can you sh show them this? The loop sometimes gets to be quite large, but you saw on the screen how we maintain this. Can you guys see the loop? Because I don't see it on the screen. You see this loop, how large the, the angle glide wire has become. But you saw on the screen how, how small we tried to maintain it. So therefore, uh, you know, the, the issue is to pull the wire back as, as, as we, everybody's been uh, describing and then advance. So now it's already 820, so we're going to go with a grand slam wire. Um, and then we're going to get it down to the distal area and we're going to advance our re-entry catheter. Can you grab a grand slam wire, guys? I presume that you, uh, that you inspect the end hole catheter and uh, that you saw no back bleeding. I yeah. agree with you. It's in there, the is a, there is a little bit of bleeding, George, and yeah. I, I'll be honest with you. I think that we've all learned, um, I know that um, uh, uh, Anwar would agree with me, that we've all learned that there are times, even in the subindimal plane, you can get quite a bit of bleeding. The other thing you could do is to advance the wire through to see if you're through. Uh, obviously, an 014 wire will not make much of a, uh, a dissection plane or prolong the dissection plane much. So I've got uh, my uh, rayless scanner holding onto the catheter to prevent any recoil of the catheter back because as you go forward yeah, with this... Yeah, yeah. 014 is not going to make it through the uh, sub -intibal. So if it does go easily... Uh, you know, forward, then, you know, you have to presume you're in the lumen. But right. And so what about it? you could see the 014 wire already down by the tip. And now I'm just going to advance it very, very slowly. If it happens to go, it happens to go. You know, uh, it, it, see, it doesn't. You see, it loops. There you go. So yeah. we are clearly in the subminimal plane. I'm going to speak to my colleagues here whether you think I should advance you think you're okay with it there. Uh, I, I, I would leave it uh, there. You're distal right. enough from your constitution right. point. The only thing I would consider... Uh, knowing that patient has such a calcified lesion, pre-dilated yeah, exactly. with a small balloon, so yep. you, it would be easier to push the uh, re-entry catheter. And that's exactly a, a great point uh, that, that he makes, because here, because of the calcium, these uh, re-entry catheters are quite bulky and are not going to be able to get it through. So I'm going to get, what size balloon would you suggest? I would, uh, I use usually at least 2.5. So get us a 2.5 long uh, 114 balloon, guys. So multiple companies make multiple balloons uh, for, these, uh, for these kind of lesions. 
So uh, we have, we, we're, we're fortunate enough to carry all different the balloons. We actually have the, uh, the, the, the 25 Nanocross by EV3 as well as the 25 uh, um, um, Fox, no, not the Fox Cross, the uh, Abbott balloon as well. So, so we have multiple different balloons. Can you grab me a 25 long balloon, guys? Thank you. So while they get the 25 balloon ready, um, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, show you how to prepare the Pioneer catheter. So the Pioneer catheter, I'm going to take it out of the box here. The, the, f the few key things with the Pioneer catheter are, are the following. One, during the prep of the Pioneer catheter, you want to ensure that the, that the actual piece uh, that, that goes into the volcano kit does not get spoiled. So they actually are kind enough to provide a little bag for you, so which we will then go ahead and cover this so this way it doesn't get wet. So the, it goes right in there and you just kind of leave it in there and then everything is done. Now this is just an empty box, so we'll just throw this over here. Now in the meantime, before I prep it, I'm just going to go ahead with the balloon. So in other words, you need that this is a catheter that has an IVAS in the end of it. So you need an IVAS connection to the Volcano IVAS uh, equipment. So this catheter has essentially three characteristics. A lumen that takes a wire that's already in the submittable space, the IVAS to visualize uh, on the side where, where is, the, uh, where is the, uh, the, the, the blood flow. Uh, and the third one that's going to aim towards the blood flow is, the, um, uh, is a needle. Uh, and then is, there is another wire that is advanced through the needle. Yeah, let me come over there. Uh, so I'm going to have Dr. Bobby have talk about the different re-entry catheters. Floral, yeah. please. Yeah. The, there are Two types of re-entry catheters. One of them is this uh, catheter that is a pioneer catheter, and uh, again, this, the other one is uh, an outback catheter. The difference is uh, that with a pioneer catheter, you uh, you can okay. use IVUS guidance, okay. and uh, uh, it will show you at 12 o'clock. The usually you you have to find the lumen and then rotate this catheter. Make sure that uh, the uh, uh, it's usually red in color, and you, you make sure that this is at 12 o'clock, and this is when you know that you have to deploy the needle, and most likely it, it's going to uh, go straight into the vessel. Outback catheter does not have uh, uh, IVUS proponent, so it, it has a, a little marker at the tip. So you ha there is, uh, you know, two types of shapes you have to try to achieve L and T, just uh, try trying to point the needle towards the true lumen and then you deploy it, you have to take uh, different yeah. angulation views and uh, uh, just make sure that uh, your uh, needle is well aligned with the, uh, uh, with the true Watch lumen. The it's a little bit more uh, difficult uh, um, uh, procedure in yeah. terms of aligning the catheter and the needle and uh, trying to get uh, into a true lumen without back uh, uh, compared to uh, Pioneer. However, if uh, and Pioneer, the problem with Pioneer is you, you have to have a yeah. volcano machine. I was, if you don't have that volcano machine, then you cannot uh, use the um, uh, sort of uh, I was component of this device. Uh, however, when we didn't have a, a volcano machine at some point, we do have it now, uh, and I had the Pioneer. What I used to do, I would cut the, just the I was broke off and uh, just use it without it. So, uh, and it did work. Um, so uh, there is certain technique how you do that, and you have to learn how to do that. But again, if you have a volcano machine, uh, then it becomes very, very easy. Uh, well, hopefully, we're going to demonstrate it to you now. If you don't have an IVUS machine, might as well use the outback catheter. Which yeah, is that's what I'm smaller, saying. If, if uh, yeah, if diameter. Uh, no, they are both uh, six French compatible yeah. now. They used to have a seven French compatible uh, only before, uh, but now uh, the Pioneer also is six French compatible. So. Um, and uh, at, at, at when I'm saying it, I'm talking many years ago when uh, we somehow got Pioneer together, we didn't have Outback, but th now we, uh, we, we have both in, in the lab. So, uh, you, uh, you know, if you have Volcano Machine, then things uh, get uh, relatively easy. So what we've done now is we've gone ahead and angioplasty, uh, and I think this is an important point that we, both, we all made here, is that not to be afraid to angioplasty the subminimal plane. Because a lot of times, you know, when we're first starting out with these cases, we're afraid of, of can you attach the Pioneer, guys? When well, you're afraid of actually, um, you know, angioplasting an area where you're not in the true lumen. And the whole point of this to is to realize that we are in the SFA and, and we're, and we're, we're going to be able to do it. So in order to get the, our equipment down, we needed the angioplasty. We've angioplastied. Now I want them to show uh, this particular catheter here closely. Can you show this, please? 
So you can see that the, the beauty of the Pioneer catheter is that you can have an expandable needle. I mean, it goes from, um, my eyesight is pretty poor, but it goes from anywhere from um, uh, 3 inches, 5 inches, and 7 inches uh, in, into the vessel. So you can actually adjust the needle. Uh, excuse me, three centimeters. I'm so sorry. I said inches. Jeez, three inches is quite long. Uh, three centimeters <laughs> into the vessel, and uh, and so so yeah. y y millimeters. Again, I said centimeters. Millimeters, millimeters into the vessel. So the point is that uh, you can actually adjust the needle gauge while in the outback you're really not able to adjust the needle gauge. The advantage, obviously, with the IVUS is very very clear, but the put th that also makes this probe a little bit more delicate. So because the probe is so small and it has an IVUS in front of it, you you, you also need to be careful. So you have a guide wire, it's actually a monorail system which makes it easy for the operator. And then you're able to put your second wire through the rear end of this catheter and into the true lumen. And uh, you know, uh, like anyone, we, we try these catheters, uh, you know, sometimes we need them and they're great rescue catheters to have. But uh, for, for, for all of us who are starting out, it's actually great to have it in the lab uh, when you do difficult cases, especially calcific SFAs or even aorta, aortoiliac occlusions where you can actually visualize where you're going to re-enter. So I'm just going to use the monorail system if I, I can barely see in my old age these days. So I'm going to use the monorail system so that you can see the wire comes out and Dr. Wiley is going to give me a rail here and pull the wire. You got to pull the wire for me as I just advance it. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, take it all the way down. We're going to be very gingery here. I'm going to go on the other side to be able to advance it. Don't move, sir. Go ahead, pull the Jose. So I'm going to go to the other side. Relax. OK. And we're going to go ahead and work here and let Anwar take over the, the talk. Go ahead. So it, uh, uh, Prakash just mentioned, it especially becomes very important when you are working with a total occlusion in uh, you know, uh, aorta iliac uh, junction. It uh, becomes very important to know where you are, and then you are actually uh, uh, puncturing uh, uh, in, in, into, uh, into a true lumen and um, in the right direction. You see how easy this went down, and this has uh, a lot to do with the, uh, with the predilation that was performed. Uh, the difficult part <coughs> always with this catheter is that, as you see, as, uh, as it goes around the arch, it may retract a little bit the distal wire, and uh, now we may be uh, just at the level or maybe right above the right. reconstitution, so we have to uh, well, what somehow we, advance both. Now, well, what we need to do now is to show the uh, IVUS, and we can show the chromoflow, and I'm lucky enough to have two experts here to help me guide through this, but it's really not that difficult. Uh, you can see here we have no flow. Is the chromoflow on, guys? So the chromoflow is on, so we're probably not at the level where we need to be because I don't see any flow at all. So we're going to go down so a little. So you're supposed to see something black at the, uh, at the, uh, at any, I mean, something uh, red at any uh, level around the, uh, around the catheter. Uh, difficult thing is that in this case, there is also a very large collateral that enters exactly at uh, the reconstitution point. So you may, uh, some of this uh, red color may be the collateral itself. But I think we feel good that this may be the lumen right on top of where we are. So you can see here that uh, we've got the, uh, the, the chromoflow there. And now we need to torque and, and actually face the needle at 12 o'clock. Now, now, if I don't know, can somebody, Michael, can you come and point where the needle is so we can show on the IVUS outside here? Can you just point? Yeah, it's okay. You can show them because I want them to see where the needle is. Are we pointing? Well, let me tell you, the needle is, is going to head exactly. Uh, let me orient the audience. Okay, There's great. A, Thank th you. There is a, uh, a black hole in the center of the cross. Uh, that is the catheter itself. Can I, can I get another uh, around, the, around the catheter mm -hmm. eccentric uh, is uh, a, a little bit of a black area, which is the summit lumen. Yeah, that's good. And then uh, all around the catheter, this very, very uh, uh, round can thing is a vessel. And in the middle Grand of that slam. vessel, at right now, at 2 cm above the catheter, exactly where they're pointing now, is a consistent red signal. This is a blood flow that is detected inside the true lumen. I think once by rotating the catheter, you want to position this uh, red blood flow to be exactly towards 12 o'clock, exactly on top of the catheter. Right now is maybe around 1 o'clock. So you got to, uh, uh, you got to uh, uh, turn it a little bit. Uh, and uh, right before you do that, you have to make sure your wire through the back hole of the catheter is ready to exit 
uh, from the needle. So you got to advance the wire and position it right above the needle. And, uh, and uh, that's pretty much what PK is doing right now. Exactly. And, uh, and then you kind of have to uh, uh, try to aim for the... Uh, Perfect. So, so, uh, for the blood flow. So as you described so well, George, we've got, uh, we all spoke here a little bit offline. We've actually oriented it a little bit past 12, between 12.30 and 1, sort of, kind of looking at the lumen, having done a few of these. And now we're going to go fire the needle. I've taken a Grand Slam wire, which is important. I mean, we've used hydrophilic wires before, but it's recommended not to because sometimes they can shear and snap. Now, having said that, I'm not being cavalier with this. It, it, it is a SFA, and obviously, if we do leave a wire there, we can trap it, and we can, we can go ahead and, uh, you know, stent across it without having too much worry, unlike the coronaries or the carotids or something like that. But to be elegant, you want to avoid that, so we try to go with the non-hydrophilic wire first. Now I've set my, uh, my gauge at three millimeters, and now there's a safety to prevent not poking yourself, so I'm going to undo the safety, and I'm going to fire, and then I'm just going to fire the needle, okay? So the needle has been Let's fired. Let's see the angiogram, please. Okay, the needle has been fired, and uh, we're still not there. So I'm just going to try to see whether this advances, and nope, it's still not there. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this back. And this happens at times. I'm going to ask Dr. Wiley to do a quick floral fade for us to have a little bit of both. Inject. But the reconstitution was a little bit lower over there, uh, PK. We're it, a little bit high, I think. We are a little bit high. Yeah. And we may have to get down a little bit lower. So, bit but lower. remember, you have that segment over there that we should be able to get into. But I'm going to go ahead and advance this a little bit more, George. Uh, so it's the, obviously we're getting a lot of resistance to it, push it, it down. And obviously, uh, just for the audience here, has retracted the wire and retracted the needle before trying to advance the catheter. As you see right now, the catheter is right next to the reconstituted vessel. So now I'm actually a lot deeper down, and I just want to teach something here. I push pretty hard, so remember it's a system that we're looking at. So I want to go back up, watch the camera please, and I want to look at my sheath. Because there are times when you push hard, see yeah, how the sheath is retracted up into the aorta? You have to be extremely cognizant of this when you're pushing hard down below, that a lot of times your sheath can actually evolve back into the aorta. Now this is a very difficult situation because you've got this, this going on. So what you can do is actually hold the outback together and just try to just advance the sheet down very, very slowly. And you know, it's, uh, it's obviously not recommended. You want to do it with a dilator. Pull. But I guess this, we're going to leave it like this for the time being. And then we're going to go ahead and, and try to get this done uh, so we can finish off this case. So again, I'm going to ask Dr. Wiley to do a floral fade for us. And uh, uh -huh. let, let's go soon in the eye, in the, uh, in the eye as well, right after this. Sure. So obviously now we've got more overlap. Oh, there we are. So we're a little bit closer. And you can see here that now I'm going to try to go ahead and fire the needle again. Um, I, uh, uh, Prakash, I think we are not at 12 o'clock there. Nope. Let's, 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 let's see where we are in the, uh, OK. Yep. So that's actually a great point that uh, was made. So I'm going to now torque this. And sometimes torquing this is quite difficult. Yeah, because no. because of this, you happy here? Uh, I don't see yeah. the flow. I don't either. Um, so I think we'll go a little bit more in. Uh, further down. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit. I'm a little worried about my catheter yeah. above, obviously because I'm losing my. Uh, Maybe just like pull and push on it. Okay. Believe it or not, I. Oh, oh yeah. It's no, not. we're not through. No, it's not through. Okay, there now you, you, see you have a great flow. Uh, but now look, angiographically, you're above. I think at one point it was there, right there, right? This is the, okay, that's perfect. The, that's, perfect. Yeah, that's a perfect. Uh, yeah. Um, so now um, we're much closer, and I'm, if it's okay with everybody in the room, I'm going to fire it one more time here. And again, you see that the distance by Ivos was three millimeters, so he's going to fire the needle either at three or at five. It was between three and four millimeters. Now that maybe you see how the wire comes out. That may be that we're against the posterior wall. Yeah. So I'm going to pull back and actually pull the the, the uh, needle back a little bit and see if this helps to be able to get this in. And it did not. So we're going to pull back again. Now we may torque a little bit to say about this what? area right here, and then try to fire once again. Don't move, sir. Why don't you fire at five? Because at the, sometimes when you fire the catheter comes back a little bit. And again, we're, we're not quite through. I think there we are, we're through now. We are through. So we got through with the, uh, with the, with the needle. 
Now I'm extremely going to be very careful walking this back because you have two wires and I'm also worried about my sheath above. So as always, actually the sheath is actually retracted back down, which is nice. As Dr. Bobby have so clearly said, we're going to push pull and because we push pull it went down. Now the key is not to pull on this wire. This wire yeah, is important. Yeah, let's inspect a little bit of the distal wire PK and see how it, so how it goes in the distal tibia vessel and all that. So, yep. You know, so just pan a little bit further down and, and so uh, now just what I'm demonstrate gonna, that. So now us. what I'm going to do is go ahead and pull the monorail wire back, which we don't need anymore. Yeah. Right? That's out, so this way it prevents any confusion. And now what I'm going to do is just advance this to show everybody. It's actually very tight, but it's clearly moving very, very smoothly, so I'm yeah. very happy with this. So now I'm going to now fix, push, fix and pull as we talked, and then we can talk about what we need to do. Well, a little what's bit the of, what? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. it's a, the, the cath it's a little yeah. tight. At, at any transition of the catheter, when it enters the sheath in the femoral, yes. needles back, yeah. when, when, it goes in the, when it goes around the arch, uh, or um, uh, when it exits the stopcock at the sheath end, proximally, it may jump. Uh, so you have to be very careful with uh, guys. Uh, detach the ibis, please. All these three, uh, detach the ibis, please. Uh, so uh, this ibis can be a little cumbersome because right now we have to detach it, and I'm going to have my uh, technician Ricky hold on to it so this way I don't uh, I don't contaminate my field. And now I'm walking it back. You just hold on to it, Rick. So I'm just walking it back, and now I'm going to ask for an 035 uh, quick cross, or actually what we use here is the Trailblazer catheter by the EV3. So we're going to go forward with that. One of the things that we talked about here is whether we should balloon angioplasty, stent, or whatever. And notice, we're really trying to be very, very careful in terms of coming out with this without losing our wire. I'm lucky enough to have uh, uh, Ray at the other end here who's going to hold on to the wire for us. He's got wire, so he's going to wipe it down. Wipe it down, Ray. So he's going to wipe it down without, without pulling it. Without pulling, exactly. <laughs> so now we're going to go ahead and put the 035. And one of the things all, all three of us discussed earlier was how we're going to fix this. But I think before we fix this, we need to look at our, um, our, uh, our reconstitution, our distal vessel, make sure we're, we're in the right area rather than be cocky about things, do things in the right way. Yes, yeah, sometimes what can happen, and you can wire. see, we oh, see if it happens this time. Yep. Uh, because the reentry was via the needle, Real. even the send hole catheters may not be able to enter yep. the distal like vessel, they may just get stuck at the transition. In this situation, uh, we would balloon it with a, a coronary 0.14 compatible balloon, uh, maybe a 2.5 or a 3.0.15. Uh, this little did more, not happen in this case. You see right how there. easily Good. this uh, uh, trailblazer catheter went right. through, and now we're ready to put a 0.35 wire yep, in order to have more of, a, uh, more of a support in our further work. Yep, get a super core wire, guys. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to inject some dye to make sure we're okay. Again, this is a good practice when you're first starting out. Give me some dye for it, please. Um, to good practice when you're starting out. I don't think a lot of us do it, but here I think when you're first starting out, it's good to do it. And I always make sure you have brisk blood flow. So I've actually, sometimes if I'm really paranoid, I'll send my O3-5 wire down just to show that you are, it's moving freely. Because if you inject in the subminimal plane, you actually uh, obliterate your, your angle to get back in. So here I have brisk blood flow, and I'm just going to go ahead and inject uh, just to make sure that we're okay uh, where we got back in. So as you inject here, you can see here you got, you got you're, in the, you're in the true lumen. And uh, now we're just going to go ahead and advance our 035 wire, and then uh, we're going to make a decision on what to do here. Based yeah. on the calcification, I'm curious to ask uh, Dr. Babayev what, what he would do in this situation. What are the options here, Dr. Babayev? The options are... Um, since we know that uh, we are subentimal, I, I personally uh, don't like to do atherectomy of the subentimal space, and uh, I prefer just uh, to stick to uh, uh, balloon angioplasty and then stenting. Uh, the very important thing is just to make sure that you, your balloon goes up, in, especially in that calcified area. Mm -hmm. Do not deploy your stent until you're absolutely sure that your balloon works, because what's going to happen to your stent is going to just cramp and then all the pulse dilations may not work. So make sure you really prep the vessel before you put self-expandable stent over there. Is there a role for special balloons Long. such as the angioscopt, Long. for example, or a similar uh, anvar? 
Yeah, you can, uh, 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 well, we have all three five wire right now there, so angioscope <coughs> doesn't come in all three five, but uh, you can uh, try, uh, uh, if, if that is a short lesion, you can try cutting balloon uh, that also comes for, uh, you know, uh, peripheral sizes, and, uh, or you can uh, try uh, angioscope, and, or you can try even a Dorado balloon, that is uh, like very tough balloon, kind of uh, non-compliant and, uh, Really, uh, if you if you have to re really push hard, uh, then you can try the rather balloon. The very important thing here is just to uh, sort of make sure that you watch what's happening to the patient, because if you push too hard and and, and ignore what that patient is having pain, you may rupture the vessel. You don't want to do that. Yeah. So when you are inflating your balloon, make sure you are watching uh, how the patient is feeling, whether they feel the pain or not. If patients start feeling the pain, um, you have to stop. You have to uh, just uh, start thinking about other ways of, uh, you know, opening that lesion. Now, so, let me ask a question here that uh, came up. Is it, uh, are you concerned with potentially losing the above knee uh, popliteal uh, for a possible bypass uh, at some point by this reentry technique or not? Or, or do you feel or, absolutely safe with the uh, or, uh, IVUS guidance? Uh, I, IVUS guidance is very safe, and uh, uh, I think that it was just demonstrated right now. Uh, okay. I don't think we are, you know, some in, in any way, uh, you know, uh, closing the door to the bypass option, because we learned, uh, uh, you know, over the you know, the last several years that, and major, many surgeons will tell you, if you're talking about uh, FEMPOP bypass, all they need is about 1.5 to 2 centimeters above the bifurcation of the TP trunk and uh, a, uh, a T uh, into the popliteal. Uh, so all they need is this about 2 centimeters. And you can basically treat endovascularly everything, uh, you know, above that point. So many surgeons feel very yeah. comfortable yeah. just good putting point. bypass grab there. So how long is this balloon, 150? This is actually a, a, a good balloon, George. Uh, uh, we've actually been fortunate, as uh, myself and Anwar remember back in the days with smaller balloon. Uh, these larger balloons make it much more easier and convenient. This is actually an Admiral Extreme, which is a 300 millimeter balloon, uh, which, uh, which again is a, is, a, is a good size to be able to really go up and down very quickly. We've been, we are also now, we're, we're using two inflations here, just to see. I want to just give a little dye there just to make sure our sheath is okay. Okay, now we see we're too far, and it's important how to visualize where you are. So I'm going to take this down. I don't want to balloon my common femoral. Go up here. And I just want to balloon the ostium of the SFA, so which I'm doing right here. We are, as a, as we, we pointed out earlier with our conversations, we want to watch for pain on the patient. So far, he has a little bit of discomfort. Our, our nurse is, uh, is talking to him, letting us know how he's going to be feeling. And we're also looking for the expansion of the balloon. And you can see it's a pretty clean expansion of the balloon. Obviously, it's a little undersized. We went with a five. But we can either do serial balloon inflations, five, and then we'll do a six. And I think we'll discuss this. We have an IVUS here that shows us that the distal vessel lumen is approximately around four millimeters. So therefore, uh, you know, it shouldn't be much of an issue to, to go with a five. So now we've gone ahead and done our balloon angioplasty. And we, we confirmed our distal placement. So now we're going to go ahead and walk this out again and then take, take one picture here. Uh, I have a question for my, my colleagues and yourself as well, George, in terms of the use of the filter. Uh, when, when do you decide on, on your algorithm for use of a filter in these type of cases, uh, Dr. Babiev? I, I, I think if you are, uh, you've been subventimal and uh, it's very, and all you did is just balloon angioplasty, it's uh, very unlikely that you're gonna have uh, embolization Plus, I think you have more than one Picture. vessel runoff there. Yes, we do. So, uh, if you have a one vessel runoff and want to be really careful, you can, of course, uh, put the uh, uh, filter down, make sure that you are safe, absolutely safe. Uh, another thing that you, you can think of doing when you are doing balloon angioplasty is uh, very slowly go down on your balloon. What happens is if mm -hmm. you're like at two or one atmosphere, you, if, if you start seeing that there is certain waste uh, uh, kind of on the balloon, you know that this particular segment should be uh, treated more, and you may uh, opt to pick a shorter balloon and just work on that segment, make sure you open it up. So then in, in that particular segment, your stand, when you deploy your stand, uh, will expand. 
So now I'm going to ask everybody, should I balloon again, or do you think we go with a 6-0 stent or a 7-0 stent? And how do you determine the size of your stent? Uh, I usually, it depends on what kind of a stent uh, I'm using. Uh, if we're talking about self-expandable stents, uh, you know, for very calcified long lesions, uh, and especially at the, at, uh, in the segments of the SFA, uh, the adductor canal, when you know, they tend to fracture when they uh, close to the popliteal, you can think about superior stent that has great data, mm -hmm. two years, no fracture rates. Mm -hmm. uh, however, it, it requires a special preparation of the vessel. You have to go one size bigger, bigger. on the balloon, mm -hmm. make sure your balloon is uh, you know, uh, you know, really uh, well inflated and very smooth. Uh, however, if you pick any others, <clears throat> other type of uh, 19 or self-expandable stand, you usually oversize by one, uh, depends on what kind of, I mean, what you believe this artery size is. Well, Ivis-wise, we had it around, around five and a half, so I'm probably going to go with a, I'm going to take another picture of the distal vessel, and then we'll decide on what size stent that you guys want to do. I mean, I don't think it's wrong with going in a six, but more important, where you're going to place the stent is very important. So it's important to realize your distal reconstitution zone um, and where you approximately were able to get in. So you can see here, right there, you have almost have a, a dual plane there. So I'm yeah. going to start with a 60150 stand. I know my pop is diffusely diseased. I'm going to start with a 60150. We do have the, we do not have the superas on the shelf here, uh, you know, and uh, I think that's one of the things that I agree with Dr. Bobby of that, that that's something that needs to be explored in these these type of lesions. So our IVIS uh, measurement of the distal vessel came back at 5.1. So we'll go with a six millimeter distal. We'll place it uh, but as, as far distal as we possibly can in order to make sure we cover that, that dual overlap zone there. So as, uh, there is a marker on the, on the wire. Uh, and uh, you know, if you go a little bit beyond the marker of the wire, that would be very good. As you see, the marker of the wire co correlates over here with this double plane image that is probably the uh, re-entry uh, point. So, right. Uh, there's uh, also, actually, I'd like to here. ask you guys also what you think about this. There's uh, you know, a lot of talk about the, the chronic uh, irritation by oversized stents on the SFA and whether that's a possible reason for these fractures and these um, uh, restenotic lesions. So I'm curious on, in terms of, you know, if you look at the strides data you know, from Abbott, um, even though the, the trial didn't work in terms of the primary endpoint, the fracture rates uh, also reflected that when you size the stents, properly, you're, you're, you're clearly able to prevent uh, uh, st uh, large amounts of uh, stent fracture. So, I mean, uh, there's a lot of issues on whether you oversize these stents, whether you undersize, uh, not undersize, or whether you go one-to-one -one sizing on these stents. So we're going to go approximately to about this area here. And I think it's, it's really just a rudimentary uh, placement of the stent. I mean, I, I think it's important to cover the dissection plane as much as best that you can. So here I know that we had a little bit of trouble, the wire was looped, so I'm going to give myself a little bit more generous space. I'm going to mag up, and I'm really going to just try to deploy the stents. A couple of teaching points on, on deployment of these stents. I mean, as far as movement of the stent here, you've got plenty of zone either way up or I mean, down for sure. But what's important is the technique of deployment. It's very, very important that you don't elongate these stents. When you, when you pull hard on these vessels, uh, you will definitely elongate these stents. And when you elongate these stents, there's also a, a higher percentage of uh, possible fracture because of the loss of uh, strength of the struts. So you can see here, can you show me about, please? You can see here as we're deploying, we're trying not to elongate this. And you can see there's a couple of areas where we need to post dilate. So I'm going to go ahead and walk this back. And I'm going to ask for another. Uh, I'm actually going to go up by one in the proximal vessel. Give me a 70150, guys, in the proximal. Another thing to maybe keep in mind is uh, if you can, if you can try uh, to deploy uh, your stent distally above the collateral. Yes. Uh, because if your stent restenosis and you deploy it distal to the collateral, then it, it, it may be a problem. Yep. But, you know, it's, uh, I think that's if, a great point. Possible. That's a great yeah. point. I think it's also a, important also to, with these, it's more important in the coverage stents, especially the gore endograft stents, uh, the viabonds. Because the viabonds basically act as a graft, and once you, once you place these stents distally across the, uh, the collateral, you've essentially closed that collateral. Well, that's an interesting uh, discussion point for opening now. What's the role of the uh, uh, bare metal stenting, such as this one you're using now, the protege, uh, uh, in comparison to a, to a viabond? 
That's great. I mean, uh, uh, Stan Graf, uh, Anwar, what do you think about? Yeah, that? well, we know there was a uh, there was a, uh, a, a trial that compared Viaband. I have to say, uh, we have to sort of point it out that it was old version of a Viaband uh, that was not heparin encoded, and the uh, uh, edges of the stent uh, were different from the uh, uh, current version when the restenosis rate. Basically, there was no much of a difference. Maybe Viaband did a little a little worse. Um, so, uh, but it, 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 we don't have the uh, clear answer to that yet. I think no, uh, big, no big deal, and given the no big difference, I would say right. demonstrated. Right. And given that the fact that a little bit bulkier devices and uh, um, uh, there are obviously uh, concerns or no unproven uh, risk of infection, uh, different in price, it hasn't really f it hasn't really flown that much. Yeah, we but have a may we may reconsider it in a new study, though. Right. Yeah, we definitely should uh, consider doing a study. Uh, there are two Perfect. points with Viabon that are very important uh, to remember before you deploy it. The first thing, the, what, what, what was kind of, uh, uh, you know, what was exciting uh, idea-wise about Viabon is that there is no tissue growth through the, uh, through the stent, right? Through the stent struts. So technically speaking, you should be seeing only uh, restenosis at the edges, and this is what you co uh, most commonly see with Viabon. And that's why you know there's uh, you know some data or even on treatment of instant restenosis with uh, with the Viaband uh, stent. We actually uh, now looked into our registry at our institution, and uh, you know uh, two-year patency rate for Viaband stent for, uh, that was used for treatment of instant restenosis was about 63 percent, mm -hmm. which is not bad. If you think, if you, we all know how bad the instant restenosis could be for long lesions in the SFA. They just yep. keep restenosing no matter what you do. Absolutely, and I think the exciting part is also the newer technology. I know that uh, both of us are involved in all these newer drug eluting balloon trials. Um, I'm curious to think uh, what, what both of you uh, especially think about the current Zilver stent um, and the Zilver data, the PTX data. So I think uh, one-year data has been published, two-year data has been presented. So I'm curious to think, because you know these are the kind of areas where long segment SFAs, uh, calcific SFAs, which are really not, you're really not gonna do much other than stent these. So it would be interesting to think, to see, see your data and see what you think as far as this is concerned. This is too long, guys. Give me a 60, please, 7060. So what do you, what do you, what do you think uh, uh, about the uh, Zilver PTX uh, and, and the data that was presented by Dr. You, Jake? You, you are talking about a uh, segment for instant restenosis? No, or in a, general? A, a native vessels. Yeah, you know, if, if you look at the, it's actually very exciting data, uh, data. We have to keep in mind that the lesion length was not that, I mean, not uh, what we normally deal with in, a, in a real life. Uh, it, it's kind of shorter. Uh, we have to, uh, but overall, um, if, if you look at the most recent meta-analysis uh, of uh, bypass surgery when the vein bypasses for uh, FEMPOP were compared to prosthetic bypasses, it shows you that at one year, the patency rate for vein bypass is somewhere about 81%. So if you look at the Zilver PTX, and again, we have to keep in mind that the, the uh, Lengths uh, of the treated yeah, lesions was short. relatively short, uh, was uh, somewhere around 85%, uh, which is kind of gets us to kind of the same result as with bypass surgery, that it considered to be the best therapy, uh, long-term therapy for, in a way for for um, you know treatment of uh, TASC D uh, uh, SFA uh, mm -hmm. stenosis. So it's very exciting data. Uh, let's see what happens at three years and uh, you know two years and five years. So and I, I, and I who think knows? you know just to build on what, what he was saying so eloquently is that the uh, the lesion lengths are really concerning. You know it's a you, you have relatively short lesion lengths as you see. This is a 300 plus uh, millimeter SFA that we've just dented. So we're going to go ahead and balloon with a postal balloon here. Uh, we have a bunch of postal balloons that are available to us as uh, we we know we have the Dorado high pressure balloon. And I also want the, uh, the Medtronic Reef High Pressure. It's not really a, 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 compli a, a, a fully uh, non-compliant balloon. It's, I call it, uh, it, it's a semi-compliant, but it's got it a little bit tougher than the, uh, the regular uh, uh, balloons that we have to post dill. The Dorado is probably the only true peripheral non-compliant balloon that you can use. So here we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and balloon the areas of the SFA that we're a little concerned. And we're going to go with a 6 millimeter balloon to really try to expand it. The largest, longest lesion this balloon comes in is, is in an 80 millimeter length. 
So we're, we're going to do this with the 6080. And it's, uh, it's rated burst pressures. Uh, I think it's uh, burst pressures around 14 or so. 12, 22, excuse me, burst pressure is around 22. As you can see, George, I have a lot of coaching here because I don't remember all this off the top of my head. But uh, we, it's a rated yeah, burst pressure is around 22. The important thing is to say that although he, uh, we used a 7 uh, seven o millimeter um, uh, stand, the post dilation is with a 6 o size to the distal reference, and then we see how it goes proximally. If we have to use a 7 in the very proximal part, perhaps we do or perhaps we don't, if we get a and, very good expansion and that's of the balloon. And that's exactly the point. The reason why I did this was exactly what we talked about, was to go ahead and, um, and get the distal vessel first, and we need to upgrade. We will upgrade to a 7 millimeter balloon. It's also important to remember coding. And also in terms of you know how you code these lesions, how you code these uh, these particular uh, cases that you do, obviously if it's well expanded here. If you don't code them well, you're not going to get paid down. And I think it's I'm sorry, sir, a little bit of pain. And and um, if, if if you're not going to get paid well, obviously these becomes money losers for the hospital. The, it's important, obviously, the economics of what we do as well, and to be cognizant of what we're doing in terms of our equipment usage here. Yeah, this is a very important area. As you see, this is where the, the stand crank is it, not, it, not expanded it, well. Crank it, crank so it, you really have to go high pressure and have a long inflation in order to expand it as well as possible. Yeah. This is the most important uh, inflation of the, of, the, uh, of the procedure today. So we went back. There's a little bit of recoil, but I'm going to accept this here. Go ahead again. It's again very difficult, you know, with the superior stent, some of the problems we've had is elongation down. Um, some of the, is elongation of the actual stent, you know, and uh, so those are some of the concerns that we have in using that stent. It is very effective. There's oh, another okay. one of the, there's another okay. one of the uh, areas that uh, is not Go. well expanded. Let's see how it Crank goes it this way. And here is what Dr. Bobby was saying so nicely that here, 14, 16, 18, so I, I'm not afraid to go up to 18 atmospheres in this down. I think I just want to try to break this as much as we possibly can to be able to get a good expansion. And uh, PK, how do you deal with pain at this uh, the post uh, uh, uh time? We give we go ahead and give morphine prior to. Uh, also, we give fentanyl if needed, and the patients are very well sedated. That's great. Down, the patients are well sedated, and usually it's a transient pain that lasts while the inflation is up and then goes right away. The important thing I don't know whether whether you could comment on this is that sometimes we've had these patients post difficult calcified lesions that the next day and the week after they have a lot of pain in the inside of the thigh and they have this inflammatory response that occurs and I'm curious to see whether whether you know you guys send these patients home walking on on any uh, pain pills uh, especially if they've had pain they usually uh, they have pain for at least uh, three four days after yep. you mm -hmm. uh, you know put your stent in for the lesion like that and um, I usually tell if there is no hematoma in the thigh, which may occur because you are stretching this vessel really hard, and uh, you may not notice like a little bleeding somewhere there, and as some of them may develop hematoma right after procedure in the thigh, uh, which is usually not a big deal, and all you have to do is just put a bandage on it and uh, just uh, keep it uh, on the thigh for about an hour, and uh, it's, it takes care of that. And I usually give them Tylenol, tell them just to take a PRN for pain and, and reassure them and tell them that in about, you know, three, five days it's going to go away and they feel, will be feeling fine. So again, now you can see the importance of what we've done. We still have some touch-up balloon angioplasty to do, which we'll probably end up doing offline. But you can see here, as, you, as, uh, as Dr. Wiley is injecting, you can see that you have, you have good flow and it's important to make sure that you have the distal vessels also uh, uh, that are patent that were there before. Obviously, you're not going to get a new vessel that wasn't open before, or maybe sometimes you do if your wire goes down far enough. Great. But uh, the, the, the point is you at least want to leave the patient with what they came in with and a little bit better uh, blood flow into their feet. The Great. patient is having, uh, is it considerable pain? The patient is having a little bit of pain. Inject. And uh, inject. He did. Okay, great. No, I don't think he did. Yeah, let's look at the runoff. And then, PK, perhaps this is uh, our last minute of the transmission. You can give us a, a picture, a, a better picture up top of the ostium of the SFA in uh, the final comments over this next uh, 35, 40 seconds. Sure. You can see here the flow is there. We didn't inject the first time. We just injected uh, uh, saline more than anything. Uh, but right now, we go ahead and uh, we see that the runoff is present. We tried to be very, very careful in hitting the ostium of the SFA. And we'll go ahead and take a look. 
and uh, whether we were very successful. Wanna, I, think, I think we were close. You want to take back the sheet a little bit, perhaps? Sure, absolutely. So, no, the sheet's actually pretty good. It's in the common femoral here. So we're going to go ahead and just take a shot enough to see this. And uh, we know we had a diseased common femoral. And you can see the ostium of the SFA. It's injected a little early, but the ostium of the SFA is covered uh, with, a little, let me, with a little bit. Let me, let me do it uh, one more time here so we're able to see it. So a little, remember, I'm not too worried about the disease in the distal in the distal common femoral. I just want to make sure that I've covered my ostium of the SFA, which I clearly have. Yeah. I've got a little bit of stent overhang into the profunda, which we prefer right. not to have. I know that uh, a lot of our, our colleagues do uh, overhang if, if need be to cover it. But technically speaking, you do need to have a little bit of overhang in order to cover that ostium. So we're, we're all about, just about done here. I think offline we'll go ahead and balloon angioplasty, uh, the, uh, the mid and distal SFA with a seven uh, to try and expand it a little bit more. And uh, it, it, sh it should work. If it doesn't, we could think about uh, you know, uh, you know, going with another stent, maybe a Supera stent within it, although it doesn't make any, any sense to me at this stage. We've opened this vessel that's been chronically occluded, and we know that the patencies aren't the best, regardless of what, what, what modality we choose, but we want to give this guy symptomatic relief. Yeah. Obviously, that doesn't change anything else that we do as far as antiplatelet therapy. We'll go ahead and put them on aspirin and Plavix. He's already been on, um, on uh, chronic lipidical therapy because of his coronary disease. The question is also adding uh, solostazole. I don't know what your thoughts are, what Dr. Babayev's thoughts are in terms of, um, you know, uh, adding solostazole. Have you I, do I, that at all? I, if a patient does have a contraindications uh, to solostazole, I usually give them solostazole. Okay. Um, you know, there's some data that definitely suppresses neo-intimal hyperplasia. We know some good data from coronary uh, trials. Uh, there is very small data for peripherals, but also encur encouraging. If patient is compliant with medications and will take it, why not? Yep, exactly. And I think that we do that to give them every benefit as well. Great. As, as far as exercise therapy, obviously everybody goes into an exercise therapy program. Some are compliant, some aren't, as we know the data also supports what I just said. But however, I think, you know, this case clearly demonstrated a few things. I mean, I think it demonstrated the, uh, the utility of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a proper technique in terms of a subintimal approach, which I think was probably the easiest approach to do this case within an hour. Number two is also we talked about how beautiful it was to use the Outback catheter to enter and the technique of using the Outback, oh, excuse me, the Pioneer catheter to enter and the technique of using the Pioneer catheter. I, I was fortunate to have these two great operators here to help me. But you can see it is challenging, but the, but the ultrasound helps you in order to be able to sneak back in. And obviously, we talked about multiple different stenting options. And now, we're fortunate enough to have, to have Dr. Babayev actually give a lecture now on, on um, the, the, the treatment uh, or the approach to intermittent claudication, which I think will be archived on, 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 our, on our website as well. Great. But uh, from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to thank you so much for coming. I know you're thank so you busy. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and uh, great job, excellent job, guys. Thank, thank you. you very much. It was yeah, great. Thanks great. again, George. Thank All you. All right. Thank you, PK, and uh, thank you, uh, 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 Dr. Babayev and Dr. Wiley, uh, for an excellent presentation. It was a very challenging case. Uh, demonstrated very nicely the use of the uh, Pioneer Reentry Catheter under IVOS guidance. Challenges with the placement of stents. Challenges with the uh, uh, with the make sure the stents are expanded. A, a little bit more final uh, expansion of the stents with 7 0 balloon, as PK said, and that will be the end of the very very successful case that was able to both recanalize the vessel, uh, maintain the runoff in excellent way, as well as nail the ostium of the SFA without uh, problems in the common femoral and the profunda femoris. The follow-up of this patient would be to have periodic duplex and ABI at one month, six month, one year, and follow up thereafter. A strong therapy with aspirin, clopidogrel, and silosozo, as well as a statin therapy and a controlled exercise program. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for attending. Any additional comments you could uh, send to us at info at peripheralinterventions.org via email. And uh, we'll see you back again on the 28th of March at 8 a.m. on a Wednesday.